right, good morning, Ember Tide. Uh, we're glad that you're tuning in with us. Uh, we just want to welcome you all here as we uh, join together as micro churches, as we watch on YouTube. Just thanks for being here. A couple things I want to share with you before we jump into our service this morning. The first is that uh, just remind you if you are meeting together, whether it's with family or whether it's as a micro church, just let us know. We'd love to hear where you're watching from and uh, be able to follow up with you on that. We're glad that you're tuning in. Uh, at the end of my message this morning, just want to give you guys a heads up. I'm including a set of prayer prompts, uh, some things to be praying for as a micro church, as a group that as you gather together that you'll be able to pray around corporately and uh, want to be able to just uh, put that in front of you. Uh, it's based off a passage in John, and so you'll be able to read that passage and then be able to pray through that, that section of Scripture together. And so we want to just encourage you, uh, before you do the discussion questions, before we uh, send you off with that, that you spend some time praying together and, and just as a tool that's, that's there for you. want to also just uh, wish congratulations to the Darash family. Uh, Emily got married this weekend to Liam, and so they are celebrating the new Dories, and uh, we just want to celebrate with them the fact that it's just a, a special time. And so they're in Nova Scotia, uh, recovering from the wedding, and so we want to just say congratulations to the Darashes and the addition to the family, and uh, we're so glad that, that everything went well. As we jump into worship this morning, I'm just going to pray, and uh, we want to just turn this all over to the Lord and go from there. So let's pray together, shall we? God, just thanks. Uh, for this morning. Thank you for the chance to gather and to worship. Thank you for your goodness and your grace that sustained us through another week. And we just pray, Lord, that you would guide us and invite us and draw us nearer into your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things together. Amen. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, good morning, Amber Tide. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, um, woke up this morning just... Uh, uh, kind of intentionally thinking about you and uh, wondering how you're doing, wondering how you're uh, kind of holding up, how your strength is, if you're feeling run down. And uh, I was reminded of that scripture from, uh, from Isaiah, and I wanted to just, uh, uh, just open today with that. Isaiah 40, 31, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And uh, those, are, those are comforting words, I hope, but there's, a, there's also something that we need to do in this scripture, and that's hope in the Lord. And uh, sometimes if you're like me, uh, you're maybe waking up on a Monday morning saying, oh, I hope the government changes the rules today, or I hope, you know, hope we can get together next week. Or, um, but this scripture says we need to hope, put our hope in the Lord, and, uh, and he will renew our strength. And so if you're feeling run down today, if you're feeling just weak, if you uh, have the desire to soar like eagles, uh, then put your hope in the Lord. And uh, maybe even during this music, uh, as, uh, as we sing here together, you, if you don't feel the, the need or desire to sing, maybe you can just uh, listen to these words and ask God to, uh, to uh, renew your strength. We're going to sing together.
by you, Lord. I pray that you would make that, uh, make that true today, Lord. And uh, yeah, just open up our hearts and our minds to the message today, Father. We pray in your loving name. Amen. that you are with us. All right, uh, one of the things that I really do, uh, I think I appreciate and I'm kind of anticipating and looking forward to a little bit more is just the idea around microchurches and their, this whole pilot project facilitating a way for us to take what kind of we talk about in big concepts here at church and actually make it shrink down to real life, like practical, this is what's in my life, and that's what one of the things that I, I think I'm anticipating and kind of 
expecting the most is that God would just kind of take some of these big topics that we talk about in church and in a way they kind of feel like a little bit too big for us and then shrinking them down into everyday life. And, and I'm really kind of interested to see how that will play out, taking theory and putting it into practice as followers of Jesus. And, and even just kind of switching, changing gears, and this is kind of where I feel like it'll, it'll be a little bit more challenging, is switching gears from consuming and just coming and receiving to actually participating in the mission of God. And, and for some of us, that, that is a gear that we haven't actually put into motion in a while, and so I'm anxious and, and kind of excited to think about what that might mean for all of us as we go forward. And so I think really this whole microchurch setup, this whole microchurch structure is an excellent boiling pot uh, for this new series that we're going to launch today called Bless. And uh, Bless is based off of a book by two brothers, John and Dave Ferguson. And so if you just did a quick search on Amazon, you'd be able to find it there. And it is really a, a, just kind of launching us into a, a strategy for sharing your faith. Now, I know when we talk about sharing our faith, that kind of brings a whole lot of baggage with it. It brings a whole lot of different feelings. And, and so if you're on the chat on YouTube this morning, just kind of share with us if you, don't, if you feel like it, just what, what is your gut reaction when we talk about sharing your faith? What, how do you react to that kind of statement? You know, maybe for some of us it kind of makes us feel a little nauseous or maybe it makes us feel a little anxious. Maybe it kind of stirs up some passion. Maybe it, it gives us a bad feeling. You remember we, we think about, you know, a bad example like guys on bullhorns, you know, standing on a box in, in a city or whatever. Um, but maybe for some of you, it's a, it's a great moment. It was a moment where God stepped in and, and did some amazing things. Um, for some of us, it kind of gives us like a, a flashback, you know, like this moment where you're like, oh my goodness, I, I remember this moment in particular, and it was such a failure. Was, I bombed so bad when it came to sharing your faith for you. Maybe that's, that's, that's what happens for me. Uh, for example, I I have, a, I have a friend of mine who is my barber, and I love, I love this guy. We grew up together when we were little kids. Uh, he was, we went and saw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies together. Like the, he was my guy, and uh, I found out that he's actually, you know, he's back in, in the area, and so I go to get my hair cut there. But also, it's a chance for me to have a discussion with him, and I remember just getting my hair cut there and just feeling God saying to me, listen, Brandon, this is a chance for you to, to share your faith. And we had gone separate ways for a while and then got reunited when he opened up his shop. And I remember inviting him to lunch. I was like, listen, can we just grab lunch after, you know, after you cut my hair? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so we went and I started talking about church. I started talking about faith. I started asking him about his faith. And, and I thought everything went really well. And uh, we get back the next month, I go get my hair cut again, and I ask him out for lunch, and it's like, no, sorry, I can't do it this time. And over the next consecutive months, I, I think it was probably three or four before, and each time getting the no, that I started to think maybe the first lunch didn't go as well as I thought the rest of the lunches went. Uh, and so I never had another, I've never had another lunch with him, and I just blew it uh, by going like, both barrels on the gospel right away without following a, a few simple strategies. And so maybe if you've got a story like that, maybe you put your foot in your mouth sometime, who knows. But the truth is, a lot of us really struggle. We have a real struggle with sharing our faith. We have a real challenge with what it means to follow Jesus' command to go and make disciples of every nation. For some of us, we, we have just had so many bad examples that the idea of spreading the good news doesn't sound like good news at all. In fact, it sounds like a real chore. For some of us, we've, we've just kind of said, all right, I'm going to stop using my words to tell people about the gospel, the good news of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection. And so we've kind of reverted to another method, which is I'm just going to do good deeds. I'm just going to live my life in a way that reflects my love for Jesus. And maybe someone will ask me about it instead of me going to tell. And so for some of us, that's kind of how we've, we've kind of defaulted our lives. We're like, well, I'm not, I've, I've had too many bad experiences where I've had to tell someone about my faith. So I'm just going to live out my faith and people will come to talk to me. 
Well, if you've done that, you've probably come to the point where you realize, actually, no one ever asks me about my faith. Um, I do all sorts of service projects. I volunteer. I help, with, I help people who are in need. And very rarely, if ever, do I ever get someone asking me, hey, what's this all about Jesus stuff? You know, what is this Jesus stuff? As Christians in the West, in the church in the West in particular, we're really having a hard time. Uh, Barna, in a poll in 2019, said that we're at the point now where 29% of Christians felt that it was wrong to share your faith. That it was actually not a good idea. That it was actually goes against what we should be doing. That number jumps to 40% plus, like in that 46% range, for people in their 20s and 30s. So just let that sink in. Not only are people struggling, there are Christians today who feel like it's not even our job. It's not even our responsibility. It's not even our right to share our faith with other people. And so you have this this beautiful thing called the gospel, the good news, as Jesus described it. Why doesn't it feel like good news? Why doesn't it feel like it's something that we need to, to share with everyone? Why are we having such a hard time with it? Well, I think part of it, and this is a complicated answer, but I think part of it is maybe because we've moved away from the way in which Jesus himself did it. Um, If you look at the scripture, there is a clearly outlined way in which Jesus himself communicated the good news of what he was all about. And that's what this series is really kind of directing us towards. That's what the focus is for this series, is how, how can we love our literal neighbors and our coworkers and our family and our friends in a way that makes it simple and easy and authentic and routine to share our faith in a way that doesn't make people freak out or doesn't feel like you're a wacko or doesn't feel awkward. That's what the series is all about. And so I'm really excited, I'm really praying for this to take root in our hearts and our lives as we kind of move forward. And, and having people around you in microchurch is just the most beautiful way to be able to live this out together. We're not doing it in isolation. And so at the heart of this message, at the heart of this series, is this concept that we are called to, to be a blessing. That God has blessed us to be a blessing. And we often think that God's mission to draw humanity to himself, to build that relationship with him, began when Jesus came in the New Testament. But that's not true. God is launching this mission to draw people back to himself begins in the Old Testament. It begins in the very first book, in Genesis. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12. And this is the call of Abraham. And it's this moment in time where God reaches out to, to Abram. He hasn't had his name changed to Abraham yet. To take this big step forward. To actually go into a land that he, hasn't, he doesn't know anything about. He has no idea where it is. He's just called to go forward. And in this passage, he's, he, God is calling Abraham to leave the familiar behind to leave his family behind, to be able to take this risky step forward, to trust God and to move into this new land, this new opportunity. And it's really a moment where Abram's future is pretty much up in the air. He doesn't have any children with with Sarah yet, and there's nothing that's that's really uh, calling him forward except the call of God on his life. So let's read this. Genesis chapter 12. Verses 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. God sends Abram on a mission that will impact the entire world. And in fact, it has impacted us as followers of, Le- uh, followers of Jesus now. God was, was going to bless Abraham to bless others. And that is the principle around sharing our faith in this series. 
This is not just an Old Testament thing, though. If you look at the life of Jesus, you can hardly turn a page in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and not see a moment where Jesus was not blessing other people. Where Jesus was not taking the, the time to impact people and their lives. So let me just give you one example, and that's the example of Zacchaeus, right? So Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, this is the story. Zacchaeus obviously is not a godly man at this point in time. He's a tax collector. He's exploiting people. He's ripping people off. He's working for the occupying power, the Romans. And so his name is literally worth less than dirt uh, to the rest of his community. And yet Jesus takes a moment and changes his life. So picking up verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy, for the people were displeased. He is gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man was shown himself to be a true son of of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost Zacchaeus is moved by this action of Jesus by Jesus saying all right we're going to go to your house we're going to have a meal together this was a, a, an extension of friendship this was Jesus saying listen you value you matter you're important and so he goes to Zacchaeus's house and you hear what everyone else's reaction is like oh he's going to hang out with, with notorious sinners. And yet in this moment, Zacchaeus' life is changed because Jesus blessed him by just having a simple meal together. And his life is changed. He gives back what he's exploited from people. He gives back more than what he's taken from them, four times as much. And he gives over and above what he's taken. And so in this moment, because of Jesus... Zacchaeus is blessed by Jesus so that and he becomes a blessing to those around him. But notice what Jesus calls Zacchaeus after he makes this proclamation. He says salvation has come to his home today for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. You can trace Zacchaeus all the way back to that promise that God gives Abraham that you will be a blessing and we're, you're going to be blessed so that you can be a blessing to the nations. Jesus highlights what was true for Abraham is now true for Zacchaeus. And that blows my mind. You know, here we have Abraham, who's kind of considered this father of the faith. Then you have Zacchaeus, who was this like, you get this impression he was like this sleazy tax collector. And yet now, because of this interaction with Jesus, Zacchaeus is now in harmony with, with the lineage of Abraham. And here's the thing that blows my mind as well. What's true of Abraham, and what's true of Jesus, and what's true of Zach Zacchaeus, is true of us as well. Paul draws that line, that straight line to us from Abraham in, G in Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 to 9. He says this, In the same way Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the Scriptures look forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in His sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when He said, All nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. We are living out that promise to Abraham because of Christ. Because of Jesus, we are, called, we are blessed because of Jesus. And we are called to be a blessing to those around us. The Fergusons use this word bless as an acronym 
for, to, for a way to actually live out that blessing kind of principle. And so what they have is B stands for begin with prayer. L is listen. E is eat. S is serve. And S is story. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to take each of those letters one by one, spend some time talking about it and what that might mean for us as followers of Jesus today. And so we're going to begin with prayer. We're going to start by beginning with prayer. And again, Jesus models all this for us. This isn't like some sort of slick, you know, uh, you know, program or some, you know, five steps to becoming a better evangelist. That's not like this. What we're trying to focus on is looking at the life of Jesus and how he lived his life while on earth and patterning our lives after that. Using Jesus as our template, using Jesus as the master and we as the apprentices. In Luke chapter 6, before he goes and chooses all the disciples, one of the things he did was he went off to pray by himself in the quiet and solitude. And you can look through all the Gospels, and and I don't have time to show you all the Scriptures where Jesus would often seclude himself for a time of prayer. A lot of times before big things were happening, he would go and he would spend some time in prayer. In Luke chapter 6, for example, verse 12, One day, soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose the twelve of them to be his apostles. So you have this moment where Jesus goes and he prays, and then he calls his disciples. There are so many times when people were demanding on Jesus when they wanted him, he would slip off and he would go spend time praying by himself. This is essential for hearing from God. It's essential to get direction. It's essential to even know where to begin when it comes to sharing our faith. We need to spend some time with God and allow Him to speak to us and shape us and guide our hearts and mold us into becoming more like Jesus so that we can actually even care about telling people about Jesus. If we don't have the heart of the Father, it's so easy for us to just to kind of go about our lives and maybe watch a YouTube video or maybe spend some time praying, maybe talk to someone about our faith, you know, when we get a second. But if we're not allowing the urgency and the heart of God to shape us through prayer, then we're never going to tell people about Jesus. Left to our own devices, we're just going to take care of our own selves. We're going to be selfish. And yet, that's not what Jesus calls us to. And so as followers of Jesus, we have to kind of reconcile what that means for us. That if we're going to pray the the prayers of Jesus, if we're going to follow the steps of Jesus as his disciples, it's going to take us into some rocky situations, some places where we might feel a little uncomfortable, some moments where we might have to get out of the boat and walk on the water, so to speak. I love what Corey Ten Boom says about prayer. She says this, We never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect that He will get us involved in His plan for the answer. If we are going to begin by praying for the people around us who need to know Jesus, we don't know how God will convict them, we don't know how God will move in their lives, but we can be sure that God will have us involved somehow. And here's the kind of important factor i guess that we need to wrestle with and weigh in our hearts is do you really want that do you really want that kind of role i because i think honestly i think if we have a moment of honest self-reflection sometimes we would rather just kind of stay on the sidelines we would rather just say hey listen we're gonna we're praying for you but we're gonna do our own thing And I think what we need to wrestle with is whether or not we actually care enough about the people around us to pray for them, to seek them out, to to follow the blessed principles and be able to tell them about Jesus. Sometimes it means that we're kind of called to, in a figurative sense, go off to an unknown land, to go into a a space where we don't really know what's going to happen, to to take a a moment where we feel uncomfortable and insecure, but yet we have to trust God, just like Abraham was when he's being called into this new land. Yet the blessings of God are just so evident 
We just need to have the courage to step into them. If we're going to take the mission of Jesus seriously to go and make disciples, we need to start with prayer. We need to, to have that as a part of our lives. And so maybe the first step for us is, is really just praying for your non-Christian friends. <laughs> maybe we need to take one step back even further than that and recognize, do I have non-Christian friends that I'm spending time with, that I'm investing in, that I'm doing life with? And we have all sorts of excuses why we don't pray. Maybe some of us are too busy. Maybe we'd say, I don't know how to pray. Secretly, I wonder if we doubt that it works. But here's what Peter Kreef says about prayer, and I think this is important for us to gather and, and, and own in our hearts. Some say that prayer and the spiritual life or the inner life or the soul's private love affair with God is an unaffordable luxury today or an irresponsible withdrawal from the pressing public problems of our poor, hurting world. I say just the opposite, that nothing... Nothing is more relevant and responsible. That nothing else can ever cure our sick world except saints. And saints are never made except by prayer. Folks, if we want to see our world change, if we want to make a difference, if we want to see broken issues become fixed, it begins, it's as simple as beginning with prayer. Praying for people to become followers of Jesus, to understand what God has done for us. It all begins with praying. The Fergusons offer up four things that can help shape our prayer life around reaching people with the gospel. All right, so here's four P's, you know, simple things to remember. One, plan. If you're going to be serious about prayer, you need to plan around it. Be intentional about it. Write it in your calendar. Make some space in your day. If that helps, uh, set a reminder on your phone. So like a timer on your phone. So at a certain time in the day, it goes off and you remember to stop and to pray for your unsafe friends. Just make it intentional, something that will spark your prayer time. If you just say, All right, I'll get to it sometime, you'd never get to it. That's the way with everything that we don't prioritize in our lives. Then there's preparing. Ask God to prepare our hearts for the adventure. Jesus is calling us on an adventure. It was never meant to be this safe, innocuous kind of life. It was meant to be something calling us into the great unknown. Ask God to increase your desire to see people come to know Jesus. I think that's so essential. I think that's so important for us. Have a heart that reflects the heart of Jesus. And ask God to give you eyes to see divine appointments. You know, a lot of times when we're waiting, when, you know, we're interrupted, a lot of times those are moments where God is drawing us closer to someone else, someone that we can pray for, someone that we can share with. And then there's places. So we've got plan, prepare, and places. And as you pray, think about where you're going to be that day. Think about the people you're going to be interacting with. Think about the places where you're going to travel throughout the, throughout the day. And then ask God to give you the places He wants you to be a blessing. Ask God to direct your steps. Ask God to put you in places where you can live out the faith that, that Jesus has given you. And then finally, people. Ask God to show you how to be a blessing to the people around you. For some of us, this is literally our neighbors. You know, uh, I always, I've been sharing recently just about our cul-de-sac. I've been praying for people in our cul-de-sac. Uh, for some of you, you live out in the boonies, and so your next neighbor is like a mile away. Maybe it's a coworker for you. Maybe it's an interest group that you're in. Maybe it's uh, a family. Maybe it's uh, your family. You know, whatever it is, people that are in close proximity to you. And remember that just by, just by praying for these people, you're doing something amazing for them. It's hard to believe, but there are some people who will go through their lives and never have the knowledge that someone is actually praying for them. That can be a real blessing to your neighbors. It could be something really special for them. So what I want to do now, before we kind of wrap up, is I just want to remind you that you, your micro church leaders should have discussion questions, and we're going to have the prayer prompt slide to be ready to throw up here in a minute, and spend some time praying. And uh, the, the prompts that we have for you today are really focused around the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. 
And in, those mo- and in that section, Jesus prays that we might be able to carry out the mission, His mission. And I think that's so essential for us to begin praying together as a group, praying together as a microchurch. How can you guys impact the area around you? How can you work together to do that? And so I want to just encourage you to do that. And as the week goes on, if you see a moment where God has really stepped in or brought something to your attention or put someone on your heart or mind, add it onto our Facebook page. We'd love to be able to share the stories and be able to see what God is doing. That encourages others to do that. It encourages people to say, hey, listen, there's something to this that things are beginning to change. And so we want to just encourage you, if you're on Facebook, to be able to do that. Uh, If not, just send me an email with the story, and I'll share it. It's a great chance for us to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So let me finish by praying for you, and then you guys can break up uh, into your micro micro churches and be able to do uh, the discussion questions and, and pray together. Let's pray. God, we just ask that as we go forward in this, as we think about how to share our faith, how to use these blessed principles, that you would help us to just lean into your heart, to understand that that from the time of Abraham, you have blessed us so that we can bless others. And I just pray that you would draw us closer to the heart of prayer, that we might be able to lift up those in our lives who are far from you. And so I, I ask God that you would transform us, begin a new work. Holy Spirit, do the things that you need to do so that so that we might see people come to know faith in you. And so, God, I just pray for each of our, our micro churches as they gather. I just pray that it would be a special time of sharing and prayer together. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week, everyone. Take care. God bless.